Well, first I want to say thank you very much to Arnie for inviting me. I have been made to feel very welcome here, and I'm honored to be a part of this series. I only hope that I can live up to the introduction that I've just been given. Uh, as you may hear in my voice, I do have a bit of a cold, so I'm going to try not to cough or sneeze too much. I'm not going to be talking tonight primarily about my book, although much of what I have to say is motivated by the kinds of concerns that go into my book. I'm going to be trying to present to you a range of different ethical issues and the kinds of responses that philosophers have had to them about procreative ethics, the ethics of having children, and about the connection of those issues to population concerns. I'm going to present quite a different, uh, quite a large number of different points of view. I want to say right now, most of these I do not myself necessarily agree with, but I think in order to understand the ethical landscape here, it's important for you to see the kinds of things that a number of philosophers have been talking about. I guess my own hope is that simply getting clear on what some of the ethical issues are and what some of the ethical responses to them have been may be the first step in moving forward on some sort of ethical resolution. So I'm going to start out by talking about two general problems. One of them you might have heard of before, the tr so-called tragedy of the commons, which I describe as a problem of resources. And secondly, what I'm going to call the tragedy of procreation. That's just my own label to try to create a little parallelism with the tragedy of the commons. And that's a problem of population. Both of these problems can be seen as versions of prisoner's dilemma. And I'm going to talk about the connection to prisoner's dilemma, and I'll review for you what prisoner's dilemma is in case you're not familiar with it. I assume many of you might be. Both of these problems, I think it could be argued, result from unmitigated expansion and a kind of commitment to me firstism. So first of all, just a review of prisoner's dilemma. And I like to explain prisoner's dilemma in a way that it was first explained to me many years ago. It was explained to me not in terms of a situation of two prisoners, but rather in terms of a situation of two nations that are engaged in a process of nuclear arms buildup. So we have two nations that we'll call A and B, and they realize that the proliferation of nuclear arms is constituting a greater and greater threat to them. So what to do? They eventually settle on an agreement to engage in a process of disarmament. So they agree to nuclear disarmament, each one of them. But having agreed to that, they still have to decide whether or not to abide by their agreement. Nation A and Nation B are both still out for themselves. They're out to do what is best for themselves. And so even though they've made that agreement, there's still a question, should they actually abide by their agreement? So you can see that if B and A both decide to cooperate with their agreement, then the result is peace. They're going to be stepping down their nuclear armament. They're, they've got a much greater chance of mutual survival. But what if B actually decides, well, I, we're going to renege because we're still nation B. It's still important for us to get ahead. It's still important for us to build up our nuclear arms. So B is going to want to renege, especially if A is gullible and naive enough to cooperate. So if that happens, we can see that B ends up with all the power because they're still building up nuclear arms. 
Conversely, if B gullibly decides to cooperate, where A reneges, then A is going to end up with all the power because each of A and B is still out for itself. It's still out to build power for its own nation. Unfortunately, if A and B both engage in that process of me firstism, in that process of uh, trying to get the most for its own nation, what we have is a return to the status quo and perhaps even an enhancement of the danger. Uh, mutual an annihilation as a possibility gets increased because they both reneged on their original disarmament agreement. So that's a version of prisoner's dilemma couched in terms of the problem of nuclear disarmament. So I'm going to suggest that both the, what I, the, both the tragedy of the commons and what I call the tragedy of procreation can be understood on the model of prisoner's dilemma. So you may very well be familiar with um, the tragedy of the commons. It was first put forward by Garrett Harding in 1968. And he talked about the kind of possibility where a number of different farmers each graze their cows on a common. And each farmer, rationally deciding for himself or herself, decides to put more and more cows on the common, rather than just using his or her own inadequate land. But of course, the more that these individual farmers put cows on the land, the more the common is going to be degraded and perhaps even destroyed. So each farmer acting individually and acting seemingly rationally is pursuing his or her own interest. And in doing so, says Hardin, each of them is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit in a world that is limited. So that's why it's a tragedy, of course, because it ends up with the destruction of the commons. So it's in each herder's interest to put the cows that he acquires onto the land. That seems like a good thing to do. But if they all do it, they're eventually going to lose the common. Um, the common will likely be destroyed. We can see this, then, as uh, an instance of prisoner's dilemma. So we can imagine that A and B this time are farmers. Whoops, sorry. Where do I? How did this happen? OK. A and B are farmers. And they could come to an agreement to limit the number of cows that they graze on the common. And as a result, the common is not overgrazed. But that will mean that both B and A are going to have to deliberately limit their own apparent well-being. They're going to have to limit the number of cows they put out. B, because B is seeking his or her own rational self-interest, B is going to be tempted not to follow that agreement. And B is going to be tempted to put more cows on the common, especially if gullible A cooperates and does not. Similarly, A is going to go through the same process of reasoning. A wants to have as many cows benefiting from the common as possible. So A is going to be tempted to renege on any kind of agreement. Um, and hope that B will cooperate with the agreement so that A alone benefits. The problem is each of them being oriented towards their own apparent self-interest end up putting too many cows on the common and the land is terribly overgrazed. The resources get used up because each party to the arrangement is thinking primarily or perhaps, perhaps exclusively of his or her own well-being. <clears throat> 
Now, we could see a similar problem with respect to procreation. And here I'm going to be talking a lot about the work of a philosopher named Derek Parfit. Writing in 1984, he published a book called Reasons and Persons, which had a lot to say about population issues. And he suggested that in some communities, perhaps in many communities all over the world, it's going to be better for people, for each of different people, if they have more than two children, whatever other people do. But if everyone has more than two children, that will be worse for them than if none do. So once again, we could see this as a type of prisoner's dilemma, as indeed Parfit himself did. So if we think of A and B in this case as two individual citizens, we could imagine them possibly deciding to, uh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong one, possibly deciding to cooperate and have only two children each, in which case the population stays level, it's going to be better for them. Less pressure on resources, they're able to support their children. But in many societies, people are going to be tempted, and we know this, that this does happen, people are going to be tempted to have many more than two children for a variety of reasons, for self-support, for working the land, for um, taking care of the parents in old age. So B, in effect, is going to be tempted to have as many children as possible. And ideally, that would happen while A, naively, cooperates and just has two. So in effect, then, B's children come to dominate, B's children come to uh, get the lion's share of the available resources. Similarly, A is going to go through perhaps the same kind of reasoning. Um, A is going to want to have as many children as possible, certainly more than two, and at the same time hope that B naively cooperates and just has only two, so that A's children will then dominate. The result, however, with this kind of reiterated decision-making going on among multiple different uh, individuals is that we have a population explosion and it's worse for everybody because each person is deciding on the basis of his or her own well-being to have lots of children when in fact it would be better for all if each individual or each couple limited the number of children that they had. So that's what I'm calling the tragedy of procreation on the model of the tragedy of the commons. But Derek Parfit has more to say about population issues and I'm going to stick with him now and go a little bit further with this. Derek Parfit says that we usually tend to assume that the morally right thing to do in life is to try to maximize happiness or to try to maximize whatever will make life worthwhile. So if you don't think happiness makes life worthwhile, then you can construe it in terms of something else like desire, satisfaction, or self-fulfillment. But we tend to think in general that it's a good thing to do good. Now, people are generally very happy to exist. Almost all of us are grateful that we were brought into existence, we're happy with our parents that they created us. So that seems to mean that having more babies is going to mean multiplying the amount of happiness that there is in the world. So I've given a kind of crude example here. Now, you have to ignore the implausibility of measuring happiness in units. Um, I'm afraid that uh, utilitarians do this all the time. Um, it's a little unrealistic 
but we are at least able to distinguish between being very happy and being not happy at all. So it's not completely implausible that we could roughly measure happiness. So if we imagine 10 people, each of whom has 10 units of happiness, we have 100 units of happiness altogether. And then if each one of those 10 people goes on and has five children, each of whom also has 10 units of happiness, uh, then we're going to have 60 people with a total of 600 units of happiness. Sounds good. The more babies, the more happiness. Now you might say that at some point that's not going to work so well because as we have more and more and more babies, there's going to be more and more crowding. There's going to be less and less of what makes life worth living. We're going to be, have to share smaller and smaller amounts. Um, so it's going to get not quite so pleasant. So let's imagine that as crowding gets worse and worse, then in the next generation, people aren't quite so happy. But still, let's imagine in the next generation, they're still going to experience, let's say on average, five units of happiness. So if the 50 children in our second generation grow up to each have, on average, another five children each, each of whom has five units of happiness, then we've created 1,250 new units of happiness, if my arithmetic is correct, which I hope it is. So it looks as if, again, despite the fact that we've had a little bit of a decline in average happiness because of crowding, it looks as if we're still creating more and more happiness. It looks like a formula for saying more and more procreation is a good thing. Now, where does that end up? Well, Parfit said it ends up in something that he calls the repugnant conclusion. And he describes the repugnant conclusion in the quotation that I've given there. Compared with the existence of very many people, say 10 billion, all of whom have a very high quality of life, there must be some much larger number of people whose existence, if other things are equal, would be better even though those people would have lives that are barely worth living. In other words, even if the average quality of life of the individuals as we produce them goes down and down, nonetheless, as we produce more and more and more of them, the total amount of happiness is still going to rise. And Parfit illustrates it with uh, a little graph like this, where the x-axis is the number of people, the y-axis is the amount of happiness. So um, you could think of this bar here as perhaps representing our current state, maybe. Uh, <laughs> there aren't very many of us, relatively speaking, and we're pretty happy. But if we think it's important to produce happiness or to produce well-being or to produce quality of life, then what we ought to do is go on having more and more and more people so that you end up with a bar something like this. And probably to make it really realistic, I should have continued that purple line right out here. So a huge number of people on average, they're not really very happy, but the sheer number of them multiplied by their minimal level of happiness is much greater than the amount of happiness contained here. This is Parfit's repugnant conclusion because he says this looks like the direction that we're going in if we think that more babies means more happiness. We're led in a direction where we seem to have to say that it's fine to have billions and billions and billions of people, 
who are not all that happy, but still the total amount of happiness is greater than what we have here. So he called it repugnant because he didn't want to end up with that conclusion. He thought it was a repugnant conclusion. But the problem for him was how to avoid that conclusion if you start with the original assumption that more babies means more happiness, that more human beings means more well-being. Now, you might be inclined to say, well, obviously we can't, you might be inclined to say, well, we, can, we absolutely shouldn't go from here to here. Why? Because um, it's wrong. Those future people, we've already admitted, won't be as happy as they might have been in a less populated world. So it's wrong because you're creating people and they're going to be less unhappy. But, Parfit said, that counter-argument runs into what he calls the non-identity problem. And the non-identity problem is simply this, that in a less populated world, many of those future people, the ones here, would not have existed at all. They would not have existed at all. So for them, the only choice is between non-existence or a minimally happy existence in a very overpopulated world. Another way of putting that is to say that, in effect, by creating all those billions and billions and billions of people, we're not really harming them. So even if we make choices that result in a huge population overflow and crowding and resource depletion, um, we're not really hurting them because our very choices are what have enabled them to exist in the first place. They would not have existed at all. And remember, most people would say even, even people in very impoverished conditions, most people would say they are glad to be alive. They are glad that their parents created them. So it would seem that we have not harmed them. If we go back again to this group, we haven't harmed them, even though their quality of life is pretty darn low. We haven't harmed them because the only alternative for them is non-existent. So I've laid out then several problems. The tragedy of the commons and what I call the tragedy of procreation, both of which can be modeled like prisoner's dilemma. And I've also talked about um, David, uh, Derek Parfit's repugnant conclusion, which seems to suggest that it's perfectly morally acceptable to produce billions upon billions of people. A lot of people have thought that there are problems with those conclusions, and the question is, how do you respond to them? So what I'm going to give you next are some, I think, reasonably radical responses to these kinds of problems of overpopulation. I'm going to talk about um, the ideas of a South African philosopher, David Benatar. I'm going to talk about um, an American philosopher, Thomas Young. I'm going to talk about the voluntary extinction movement, or vehement, as it calls itself. And I'm going to talk about state control of reproduction. So each of those is an attempt to provide a moral, what they claim to be a moral response to the problems of overpopulation. So let me start with David Benatar. He's really an interesting guy. I've actually met him, and uh, he's uh, quite fascinatingly consistent in his views. So um, 
David Benatar takes the view that Derek Parfit was wrong to think that when each of us comes into existence, we are benefited. So Parfit believes that in most cases, unless your life is absolutely miserable, and, and presumably very few lives are absolutely unmitigatedly miserable, unless you fall into that category, you are nonetheless benefited by coming into existence. Now, Benatar denies that. He says that people are not benefited by coming into existence. That's a crucial mistake. And he says, in fact, we are harmed by coming into existence. So the, the crux of his argument is right here, and I've quoted it. Um, although the good things in one's life make it go better than it otherwise would have gone, one could not have been deprived by their absence if one had not existed. Those who never exist cannot be deprived. That's crucial. Those who never exist cannot be deprived. However, by coming into existence, one does suffer quite serious harms that could not have befallen one had one not come into existence. Now, Benatar has written a whole book on this, and he's actually quite adamant about the kinds of harms that we suffer. Um, even those of us in very privileged parts of the world. He actually has um, a kind of uh, a whole theory about how we all are, in effect, Pollyannas who learn to ignore the really bad parts of our lives and only dwell upon the good parts. And we forget how much of life involves suffering, sickness, uh, the sadness of people dying, um, things like the pain of childbirth, the end of relationships, um, feeling hungry, feeling exhausted, and then eventually having to die ourselves. So um, I'll, I'll just tell you one thing that Benatar said to me when I attempted to argue with him. <laughs> he, uh, I made the mistake of telling him that I have two children. And uh, he said to me, uh, just think, if you hadn't had those two children, then they would never have to die. So, um, just to try to make his view a little more plausible, this is a chart that he uses to try to illustrate what he's talking about. So we have two possibilities here, scenario A and scenario B. In scenario A, X exists. So in, the, in this world, let's imagine, X exists. In this world, X never exists. So if X exists, X experiences pain, lots of pain, and that's bad. <laughs> I'm trying to be fair to him here. You're not supposed to be laughing. Uh, you should try arguing with him. I mean, I went down to South Africa to give a paper on this, and he assigned himself to be my commentator. So. <laughs> Um, so, now, he doesn't deny that we do experience some pleasure, and that pleasure is good. So, if X exists, X experiences bad and good. In Benatar's opinion, lots and lots of bad, much more than we recognize, and some good. But, imagine a world in which X never exists. Then, the really good thing is that X will never suffer. X will not have any pain whatsoever. And that is good. Benatar says we all recognize. So, so here's a case that he gives that um, I think might be a little bit um, somewhat convincing anyway. He says, we all understand the rationality of a choice not to have a child if we were to know that that child would suffer miserably in his or her life 
and then die, let's say, of Tay-Sachs disease or something. And we would consider a decision not to have that child to be a good one because we take it that the absence of pain, the absence of suffering, is good. At the same time, Benatar says, the absence of pleasure is not bad. The absence of pleasure is not bad unless there is an existing person to suffer that absence. But hy by hypothesis, X does not exist. So there is no absence of pleasure to be undergone. So if you compare these two columns, when X exists, X has bad and good. When X doesn't exist, there's good and not bad. So it is therefore always better not to come into existence, according to Benatar. Okay. Um, on to the next argument. I can see you were convinced by that one. <laughs> Thomas Young takes um, a very different approach. Thomas Young says that he's directing his argument to people in um, the developed world, people in relatively affluent societies. And in particular, he says he's making an appeal to people who care about the environment. So he says he's, he's appealing to what he calls mainstream environmentalists. So he argues that procreation, having even one child, is a form of what he calls eco-gluttony. Because having even one child more than doubles one's own footprint. Why? Because that child is going to live longer than you do. So you're not just doubling your, your, um, your footprint, but you're doubling it for extra years. And of course, it's quite possible that your child will go on to have more children as well. So he issues a challenge to mainstream environmentalists. He says, would you, as a mainstream environmentalist, think that it's morally justifiable for you to more than double your ecological footprint? And if you think that's not morally justified, then you ought to recognize that it's not morally justified to have even one child. Having even one child, he says, in an affluent household usually produces environmental impact comparable to an intuitively unacceptable level of consumption, resource depletion, and waste. Now, just a, a reminder, going back to Dr. Sanderson's talk in the, at the beginning of this series, in his talk, The Demography of the Seven Billion, um, which I really enjoyed watching um, on the web, he pointed out that in 2010, the average Canadian emitted 16.3 metric tons of carbon dioxide, whereas the average Ethiopian emits 0 0.1 metric tons. So one Canadian produces as much as 163 Ethiopians. The point here being, and this is, this is what Young is drawing upon, the point here being that those of us in North America are hugely, having a huge effect on the environment in a way that people in less developed world, um, parts of the world are not. They are not costing as much for the environment. So for that reason, says Young, there is a real moral question for us as to whether we're actually justified in having even one child. Our tendency in the West has been, in the past and maybe still today as well, to um, see uh, population growth as a problem elsewhere in other countries. 
But when you see the nature of population growth, according to Young, as a problem in which um, each Canadian is equivalent to adding 163 Ethiopians, then you see, he says, where our responsibility lies. Now, on top of that, I think we have to add the fact that, of course, our life expectancy in the West is growing. It's growing to a really remarkable degree. These are um, figures from Statistics Canada. I didn't include 1931 because um, there was actually a slight drop in 31, I guess because of the effects of the Depression. But other than that, um, Statistics Canada produces a pretty steady increase in life expectancy. So part of the point there is not only do we have a huge environmental footprint, but we're living longer and exerting it for longer as well, which from Thomas Young's point of view, makes his challenge to mainstream environmentalists even more um, challenging to deal with, I think. Okay, so the next thing we'll look at then is the voluntary um, human extinction movement, which in a sense um, takes Benatar's and Young's ideas to their logical limit. Um, so the voluntary human extinction movement advocates voluntary human extinction, as the name suggests. Um, the problem with the human species, according to Vehement, is that our survival tends to mean the endangerment and indeed the extinction of many other species. And that's a moral cost that we need to take into account. So from the point of view of vehement, um, what we ought to be doing is aiming for our own extinction in order to prevent the extinction of other species. Now, if you find this idea implausible, um, as I certainly did, you might just want to consider this story. I was, uh, a few years ago, I was teaching a uh, large undergraduate course called Life, Death, and Meaning. And we had a section in that course on extinction. I assumed that none of my students would see anything good about human extinction. So I went into class that day expecting that the discussion would be very one-sided. But I asked my students how many thought that human extinction would be a good thing. And I was very surprised to find 14 or 15 of my students who readily put up their hands. Very, very surprised. Um, so this is an idea, apparently, that some people are considering, that young people are considering. Um, and I think that it's one that needs to be evaluated. I think many of us intuitively assume, and I include myself, that the extinction of the human species would be a very bad thing. The philosophical question is, if it would be a bad thing, why would it be a bad thing? Are there sufficient good reasons to justify the continuation of the human species given the costs that we know our continuation incurs on this planet? So the last radical response to population problems that I'm going to talk about is state control of reproduction. And here I take us back temporarily to Derek Parfit again. Um, and I have a quotation from him as he says, in an overcrowded society, a system of rewards or penalties aimed at stopping population growth might be democratically adopted. 
Even if it was imposed undemocratically, such a system might be welcomed by all, he says. Another solution would be provided by reversible sterilization after the birth of one's second child. This is a better solution since it would impose no penalties. It's kind of an odd statement. So, of course, immediately um, what you might think of is China's one-child policy. Now, we know that the one-child policy primarily seems to apply to urban couples and requires them to limit themselves to one child. It seems not to apply so much to rural couples. And I understand that there is some loosening up of the rules gradually developing, such that um, parents, each of whom is an only child, may be allowed to have two children when they, when they get together. Um, but still, at this point, it is a fairly restrictive system. It does uh, levy monetary fines and loss of benefits, which I think is um, quite significant uh, for a lot of people, in cases where people fail to comply. And there are certainly plenty of reports of forced abortions and forced sterilizations as a way of trying to keep the population down. So, so far I've talked about um, the original problems, problems, the tragedy of the commons, the tragedy of procreation, the repugnant conclusion, put forward by Derek Parfit. Then I talked about four fairly radical responses to those population problems. David Benatar saying it's just better never to exist. Thomas Young saying having even one child in, uh, in a well-off country is equivalent to eco-gluttony. Um, eco um, the idea of vehement, that we should aim for voluntary extinction, and the actual idea of state control of reproduction, which is at least hinted at by Parfit and which is actually lived out in reality by China. So if you don't like those kinds of radical responses to population problems, the question is, are there adequate ways of defending continuing human procreation. Can we say that the four radical responses that I talked, up, up, talked about up here are mistaken? Can we show that there's a serious problem with all of them? And I'm now going to just list three that you might think of. Um, each of which I think is probably not satisfactory in its own way. And then I'm going to come to a very modest alternative, which doesn't really solve all the problems, but uh, probably just reflects what uh, David Benatar would call my Pollyanna-ish um, uh, hopefulness. So first of all, religious views. So maybe somebody could say to Benatar and to uh, Thomas Young and to the vehement movement, well, you know, there's a biblical injunction. We know in Genesis that God supposedly told the first human beings to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, of course, that argument isn't going to work too well for atheists or agnostics. But even if you believe in God, there's still a further question as to how you could actually know what God's intentions and wishes are. Um, does the biblical injunction to be fruitful and multiply still apply at a time like now when there are 7 billion people and at a time when we're headed for... 10 billion um, within this century. Um, does it still apply at a time when arguably the earth has definitely been subdued? 
Um, how far can religious views actually take us here? A second possibility for defending procreation is to uh, make an appeal for the alleged intrinsic value of human beings. And here, <coughs> excuse me, here I'm quoting a philosopher named Axoy. And he says that human existence is essential and it's the prerequisite to everything good or bad. Every life is worth living, even if it is worse than some other lives, if the only alternative is non-existence. Life and existence are always better than non-existence, and therefore it is irrational and immoral to sentence someone to non-existence while you have the chance to bring them into life and existence. So Axoy's view is that every human life is intrinsically valuable. Given that it's intrinsically valuable, it's a good thing to go on creating new life. It's a good thing to go on having more and more babies. But there are two, at least two problems that I know of with that point of view. One problem was put forward by um, very interesting philosopher named James Lenman. And he said that even if, even if you go along with the idea of intrinsic value, and intrinsic value itself is kind of mysterious anyway, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to know what exactly it means to say that something has intrinsic value. Some philosophers um, actually cast doubt on the idea that that anything can have intrinsic value. I, I myself think there's probably some use to uh, ascribing intrinsic value to human beings. But he said, even if you do uh, think that something is intrinsically valuable, it doesn't necessarily imply that there should be more of it. And he gives the example of white rhinos. And he says, what if you were to say white rhinos are intrinsically valuable? They're pretty rare, they're intrinsically valuable. Nonetheless, even if they are intrinsically valuable, that doesn't necessarily mean that you think there should be white rhinos in the north of Scotland, for example, or white rhinos in Australia, or white rhinos in Vancouver, BC. The fact that something is intrinsically valuable, if it is a fact, is not by itself an argument that there should be more of that thing. So that's one problem with the idea of intrinsic value. But here's another problem with the idea of intrinsic value. I think that if you follow Axoy's argument, remember here he says, um, Existence is always better than non-existence, and it's irrational and immoral to sentence someone to non-existence while you have the chance to bring them into life and existence. I think that that has the effect of creating a new repugnant conclusion. It has the effect of creating the same kind of problem that Parfit was worried about um, that comes about if you say that creating babies creates more happiness. Because you then seem to have a moral imperative to create more and more babies in order to create more and more happiness. The same problem, or comparable kind of problem, seems to follow from Axoy's view. If you take the approach that human beings are intrinsically valuable and therefore there should be more of them, then you have no stopping point. You just go on producing more and more and more and more, no matter how miserable they may all end up being. So we're still asking ourselves, can we continue to defend procreation in the face of the kinds of problems that I outlined at the beginning? 
And in the face of the, the radical critiques that I listed from Benatar, from Young, from Vehement, and from state control of procreation. Well, people very often say in this context, human beings have reproductive rights. That's what defends procreation. We all have reproductive rights. Um, and so we're quite justified in going on um, procreating because we're acting on that right. Well, first of all, I think it's, it's important to distinguish between two different kinds of reproductive right, the right not to reproduce and the right to reproduce. The right not to reproduce, in fact, has been, um, has turned out, I think, to be extremely important, particularly for women, particularly in the West. And the right not to reproduce is, at this point, pretty well recognized in Canada. Uh, it's not so long ago, probably not much more than half a century, um, that it was actually illegal to advertise and distribute contraception. And it's not that long ago that abortion was in the criminal code. Now, contraception is quite legal to advertise, to distribute, to use, to prescribe. Abortion has been taken out of the criminal code. Um, in Canada, we've come to recognize the importance of the right not to reproduce. But that's, of course, not really what people are talking about when they talk about defending procreation. What they're talking about is something like the right to reproduce. And that right does seem to be included in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So um, the declaration, whoops, darn. Uh, the declaration says, uh, men and women of full age without any limitation um, due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to found a family. And that little phrase, to found a family, has, has been interpreted for decades to include the whole idea of the freedom to have children when one wants. So the question is, does the right to reproduce then um, save us from all our ethical problems of procreation? Well, we could ask ourselves how far the right to reproduce extends. So consider two um, modern phenomena of American culture, 19 children and counting. You familiar with that uh, reality show? The Duggar family have 19 children. They belong to a religion that um, is founded upon the idea of having as many children as possible. Um, they take the view that it is morally justified to have as many children as you possibly can. Children are like flowers and you can never have too many flowers they say. So does the right to reproduce justify having 19 children? Similarly, we could think of uh, Nadia Suleiman, who is perhaps rather cruelly named by the media, Octomom. She is the woman who has 14 children. She's a single mother. She had all of them by means of in vitro fertilization and then the subsequent implantation of multiple groups of embryos in her uterus. Her last pregnancy is the one that actually produced eight live babies. Um, I think many people are absolutely amazed that the children all survived and uh, it's not yet clear um, what kinds of impairments, if any, they might have. Of course, the um, the problems for children greatly um, increases the higher the multiple pregnancy is. But does um, Nadia Suleiman's reproductive behavior, is that protected by the right to reproduce? 
I think that we have a question here as to how far reliance on a right to reproduce can actually go. You might have a right to something, and yet it might not always be morally justified to act upon it. And particularly in a case where um, having 19 children or having 14 children is not good for the children themselves, or more broadly, where um, having huge numbers of children turns out to be bad for the society or for the planet itself, it seems as if there might be some limits to how far the right to reproduce could actually go. Okay, so is there an alternative? What I've given you so far is many, many different philosophical views. Um, I think you can probably see that there are difficulties and challenges with almost all of them. Um, there are no easy answers here, and I certainly could not pretend that I have an easy answer. So I'm just going to make a few very modest suggestions. So the first suggestion I would make, which is one that I, I made in my book, Why I Have Children, is that it is important to see procreation as an actual ethical decision. Um, I argue that it isn't just a personal decision. It isn't just a pragmatic decision. It's actually an ethical issue. And it's an ethical issue at least because it involves bringing another human being into existence. And I also argue that in this culture, and perhaps in all cultures, we ought to start um, removing the burden of explanation from people who are childless. You know, right now, the burden of explanation tends to rest on people who don't have children. They get a lot of pressure. When are you going to have children? Are you having a baby next year? What's the reason you can't have children? Just relax a little and it'll happen. <laughs> we put all that kind of pressure on people who don't have children, and yet we never think to put pressure on um, people who do have children. And I'm not suggesting that we should. I'm not suggesting that we should put pressure on people who do have children. But I think it's remarkable as a cultural phenomenon that we expect people who don't have children to account for their decisions, and yet we never seem to expect people who do have children to account for their decisions, unless perhaps they are very impoverished single mothers. That might be the one exception where we expect people to do some explaining. <laughs> um, second aspect of, of my very modest comments at the end is that there are some glimmers of hope. Um, first of all, the fact that access to contraception and abortion is growing, um, the fact that uh, women and men have more choices than they've ever had before about whether or not to have children seems to me to be a very, very hopeful thing. Um, in my own case, just hearing my own grandmother and my mother talk about what it was like for them with respect to having families, they didn't have much choice and they didn't have much control. The fact that we have more of that seems to me to be very hopeful. We also know that everywhere on the globe, when women get more education, they end up having fewer children. I think that's a really important point. Thirdly, adoption is, I think, more and more seen as a morally tenable alternative. An alternative that, with the scarcity of adoptable children here in our own society, often may involve giving um, new parents to a child from another culture. And I would never downplay some of the um, cultural and ethical issues that are involved 
in cross-cultural adoption. I certainly don't want to deny them. But I think the fact that cross-cultural adoption is um, a phenomenon that is more available is very, very significant. In fact, recently at um, a couple of conferences that I've gone to, I've actually heard some, some young women philosophers argue very seriously that from a moral point of view, adoption is actually more morally justifiable than having one's own biological children. I'm not sure if I would go that far myself, but I think it's very interesting that people are even voicing that possibility now. I hear that as uh, a new idea. Finally, I think that a lot of the problem that we've gotten ourselves into with respect to resource scarcity and with respect to um, increase in population is partly a function of how we see ourselves. So remember when I opened by talking about prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma involves individuals operating for their own benefit, apparently rationally, to maximize their own well-being. But ironically, as Prisoner's Dilemma shows us, when people do that, they end up, quite often, making everything worse for everybody. And so I'd like to hope, in a world that in many ways is getting much smaller and where much more communication is possible, that we may be starting to see ourselves more as social selves, as part of small and large communities connected everywhere, including globally. And as my final point, I'll just introduce you to um, some of the main reasons that I care. Uh, these are Ewan, uh, my six-month-old grandson, Nathan, my one-month-old grandson, and Emma, my um, three-month-old grandniece. And my hope is that each of these babies will grow up to be truly global citizens who will see the kinds of choices that they make, including their procreative choices as decisions that are not just about them or their immediate families or their immediate well-being, but rather as decisions that are part of their lives as nodes in a huge network that extends all over the planet. Thank you very much for your attention.